welcome to another episode of Banking Matters. I'm your co-host, Ashton Woodling. You're reaching us today on the first Monday of the month. So joining me today is Daniel Baker. Hi, everyone. Dan, we have committed to doing these episodes together once a month, right? First Monday of the month, just you and I uh, being a little bit ridiculous. So I have a question for you, though. So you've been back from paternity leave now, boy number five, for about a month. How's life? You know, uh, just for the audience, we'll we'll reiterate what you just said again. Boy number five. I think that right there kind of just sums up how life is. It's been, it's been a little chaotic, a little bit crazy, but we're, uh, we're, we're making it through. Actually, actually, I have a funny story for you. Okay. So I have my oldest is a 10 year old and my youngest, obviously being a newborn, my, my second oldest is an eight year old. And this guy, like I'm an attorney, this guy is an attorney to be like, <laughs> like he's got the skill set down pat and he comes up to us and and we had just told him no it's like no you can't play video games or or, no you have to go to battle or whatever it was we had told him like no you can't do this and he came up and he's like dad you you're not supposed to tell me no and you're supposed to take my feelings into consideration (laughs) i'm like uh okay he's like yeah that's what the parenting book says (laughs) (laughs) So so we have this we have this book on my shelf that someone gave us like sometime like when we were first having kids or whatever and evidently like he picked it up and he read the parenting book like an instruction manual and he was trying to teach me how to raise how to raise kids it was it was great i bet it was <laughs> constructive criticism feedback constructive feedback from my 8 year old i mean something i need to take into consideration yeah, like everybody has room for improvement Uh, Yeah, everybody. (laughs) I love that. What about you? I mean, life's probably been keeping you pretty busy as well. Life has been busy, Dan. Did you know that I am a Girl Scout troop leader in my spare time? Oh, you know, I I heard a rumor of that. I am. I know. I've been hustling the cookies um, on our internal team site. Yeah. So, so for like, you're going to send some shipments my way, right? Yeah. Have you seen the shipping prices? Um, so yeah, so for the rest of the world, like I'm sure, you know, it's Girl Scout cookie season, which, um, what you probably don't know if you're not a Girl Scout troop leader is that's a freaking lot of work. It takes a lot of time. So right now my life is consumed with Girl Scouts, Girl Scout cookies and first aid training, because as a Girl Scout troop leader, you have to take your girls camping and somebody has to be (laughs) first aid trained. So all week I have felt a little bit triggered by watching these videos of like these, these little kids who are non-responsive. So it's a, uh, that's a, that's a good way to spend your week. I mean, that's I'm always comforting actually. and makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. It's awful. I'm hoping that I never ever have to use this. Um, not because I never ever plan to take my girls camping, which, cause we've, we've made some, some promises. Um, but that obviously that, that they all make it through safe and sound. So are are you a camper? Like, is this is this something that's like in your blood and your DNA, or is this is this, this is like a whole new experience for you? Sure not, because the last time I had gone camping before becoming a Girl Scout troop leader, I was about eight years old, and it was with my mom and my stepdad and my step siblings. And um, Daniel, we weren't like great campers. Okay, so so the tents got set up on a slope, and then it rained. Uh-huh. Um, so my vivid, such vivid memories of huddling with my stepbrother and stepsister in the corner of the tent while the rest of the tent was underwater <laughs> and hadn't gone back. Cause that was traumatic and awful. Um, and so like my husband loves camping and thought it would be great. Um, and listeners enjoy that. My husband's name is also yeah. Daniel. So, you know, we have husband Dan and we have just to add some confusion. In yeah, there. exactly. So anyway, I tell husband Dan now, like that you, he would want to go camping and I would say no, because that sounds awful, but you go, mm-hmm. like you go and I will stay home. Well, now that I'm a Girl Scout leader, I am outdoor level certified three, level three. Um, and I'm pretty sure I know more about the outdoors than he does now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, my I promised my boys about once or twice a year that, that we go we go camping. Um and my first year in Texas, I made the mistake of, of promising that, that that we would go camping and I missed spring. <laughs> to me, spring, I'm thinking, spring spring is cold. You don't go camping in the spring unless you're going for like a polar bear or something like that. <laughs> like it, it's it's still freezing cold in the spring. And then summer comes along and I get busy and then August comes along 
And it's like, well, I, I guess this is my chance to go camping. So if you know anything about Texas in August, you know that like in the middle of the night, it gets to a, a brisk 95 degrees. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's like all over 100 degrees. So we go we go camping and, and it's supposed to rain that night. So we put the fly on the tent and it just traps all the air inside the tent. And yeah, that that didn't that didn't last very long. Let me tell you. Sounds awful. Were you at least like backyard camping where you could shift back indoors? No, we we were we were in the we were in the forest. Like we were out in the middle of nowhere. Like no electricity, nothing. Like it it was it was. We took the fly off and we just dealt with the rain. Oh my gosh, you <laughs> camped for real outdoors. See, yeah, yeah, gosh, real, real camping. I should. Yeah. Know. Okay. Well, so I'm gonna go lodge camping. <laughs> certified to sleep in a giant room that's covered oh, that's room awesome. <laughs> that's great. yeah i told my girls they're not even allowed to bring tents that first one because i'm not going to set up 15 tents <laughs> <laughs> perfect i know. do it <laughs> i know so that's what's going on in our personal lives so let's let's circle back to the reason we're all here though compliance um so I want to kick us off because I know what has been occupying my life. And I've actually got two things, but um, as a virtual compliance officer, I run a lot of compliance committee meetings, right? And it's our job to sort of uh, steer the course and make sure banks are on the right track. And so it's a new year. So new year, new us, right? Um, so it's right. time to, to get in line and make sure we've got our schedule lined out and that we know that we're going to meet all of our annual requirements for the year. So, so we all know we have certain things we have to do at least once a year, right? We have to send out our um, our annual surveys for Rego and figure out who our related interests are. We've got to do our BSA risk assessment. We've got to um, do all those uh, check the box kind of things that have to be done at least once a year. So making sure that my banks get that all lined out right now and that they're set up for success mm -hmm. for the rest of the year. Uh, the other thing that they do in that though is we, we schedule out the reporting that they're going to look at. And here's where I'm going to kind of climb up on my soapbox because I think in, in my experience, banks get a lot of reports, right? And not just like at compliance committee, but at the board level. And so one thing that I'm going to share from my soapbox is consider why you are looking at these reports and remember that they're supposed to work for you, right? So Thanks. for a lot of banks, when you say, okay, you're getting this report, why? They say, do you know the answer, Dan? What do they say? Oh, I don't know. Oh, you know, well, okay. Well, that's one of them. Yeah, you're right. Um, but <laughs> the other answer is like because an auditor and an examiner told me I had to. Right. And so while that is probably true, and while it might sound like something of an abusive relationship, um, it's not. But I can assure you that there's no specific format requirements or anything that says what can't be included on that report, right? Mm -hmm. Most things, it's just like, make sure someone's got some oversight. So what I like to have my banks do like once a year is take a step back and look at what you're looking at and make sure it still works for you, right? So maybe you're getting a report of all of the exception rates on consumer loans. Um, and that's good because examiners are going to ask, do you review that? Do you have oversight? Yeah. But does that report actually show data that's helpful? And can you can you act on that? And then take that opportunity to pivot, right? There's nothing like the new year to make sure you've got great habits. Right. So that's 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 my biggest thing right now is making sure that all of my banks are set up for success for the year and that we're we're taking fresh looks and making sure our reporting works for us. So I've always wanted to ask, because I know you VCOs, you you're in committee meetings quite a bit. Like you spend a decent amount of time bouncing around in these, these committee meetings. Who's usually attending these things? Is it just you and, and a compliance officer or a C-level executive? Who, who are you speaking with? So um, it is de totally dependent on the bank. So some banks, it can be just a few people. And um, I was in a compliance committee meeting for a large bank yesterday. And I happened to look at the list of attendees and see that it said 32. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of people. But um, it's generally folks that, that have some ownership, right? Because the second line, the right. compliance department doesn't own the compliance risk. Really, that's owned in the first line. It's owned in the business lines. So the folks in those meetings have to be the stakeholders. So I think um, it's important, number one, to have risk representative, right? So your chief risk officer or whoever that looks like. Uh, somebody from the head of each business line should be present. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe that's like 
your senior lender, uh, maybe that's somebody from your, your loan operations department, somebody who's over your retail stuff, like whatever that might be, the heads of those business lines, because yeah. as you're sharing like compliance updates, they need to take that back. So those folks are really important. But do you want to guess like the number one missed person? I'm totally making, there's no like actual stat here, but in my experience, the the person who's often overlooked and not invited to these meetings? Uh, I'm going to say something obvious, like an auditor or... No, no. Sometimes audit can come, but a lot of our banks, Dan, a lot of our banks don't have their own audit department, right? They outsource that. So okay, right, right. yeah, um, but it's actually marketing. So... Oh. Yeah. So we know in our roles, marketing has so many compliance requirements, but often marketing yeah, doesn't get a seat at these committee tables. And so yeah. it would make sense though, right? Like you're going to get a better, yeah, yeah you're going to get a better Just marketing and we can get everything going. Yeah. Yeah. Be a, have, you'll have a better relationship with your marketing folks if they know where you're coming from and they see things coming down the pipeline and they know your why, not just because you're hateful, right? You can be two things. <laughs> Just because you don't want to make their life more difficult, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's just because I have to. That's perfect. Well, my uh, my tidbits are obviously going to be a little bit different than yours because because yours are drawing more on the, the VCO experience. But we spend all day long answering just a ton of questions on the the hotline and on the the chat and email side of things that are about like fees and and where fees go in the CD or can I charge this fee? Can I can I charge that fee? And and it's it's a pretty common. It's a pretty common occurrence that we, we get a question like this. Um, well, CFPB has actually been been really active this year with with proposed rules. I mean, they they've released stuff about the FCRA. They've they've released a couple just recently about about junk fees, and those those two are actually the ones that I really want to really want to speak on. So on, on January seventeenth, um, a new proposed rule was was passed. That, that would ultimately try and close a loophole that, that's been in the, the regulations that, that has allowed banks to charge exorbitant fees when it comes to, to overdrafts. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of background on that. I mean, the Truth in Lending Act was, was passed by Congress. The following year, the Federal Reserve established regulations to, to implement it. And, and the law mandated that lenders must transparently disclose credit costs to borrowers. However, there was uncertainty around the timing of deposits and withdrawals and the processing of checks during that time. So it wasn't that there wasn't the, the computer technology that we have today where everything's processed really quickly and, and everything like that. And so in order to address that, they kind of made a little bit of an exception for overdrafts and the disclosure requirements for overdraft loans and, and things like that. Well, the, the CFPB decided to, to officially address that and, and put in a new proposed rule that would actually require financial institutions to treat overdraft loans in, the, in a similar manner to credit cards and, and other loans, where they would, they would be required to provide very explicit disclosures um, and, and very explicit requirements for that. Uh, they've also started to to start the process of, of kind of curbing the fees that that bank can can charge for some of these things. So the proposed rule actually suggested benchmarks of, of three dollars, six dollars, seven dollars, or fourteen dollars, of kind of being like a, a cap of what what banks can charge if they're just doing the fee with the the cost for for the the overdrafts. Then on on the twenty fourth, they actually started attacking junk fees again, um, where they're they published a proposed rule that would stop financial institutions from generating revenue through through very specific kinds of, of transactions, like the debit card transactions where you swipe it or tap it or, or click it or, or anything like that. Um, they said that any insufficient or not sufficient funds fee um, that's declined in, in real time, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be there. They should be getting rid of those fees uh, completely. And, and that's a big deal. I mean, like, Last year, I think they they published a stat that that overdraft fees and, and non sufficient funds fees was something like a twelve billion dollar industry, or maybe they cut it down to to nine billion dollars last year. But but that's a that's a really big like industry for for banks. And the director's actually been I don't know if you've heard about this, but the director of the CFB's actually been been pretty harsh on on overdraft. Have you gotten that a lot on your your side or on on junk fees? Have you gotten that a lot on your side of VCO? Yeah, so one thing about that latest one that came out, that was the one that from Wednesday, they're the sorry, the 24th, right? Was 
Um, mm -hmm. The one you mentioned where they said, if you, if you swipe and it's declined, you can't charge on that one. I, I have to say, Dan, I kind of had to laugh as I'm reporting this in my compliance committee meetings, because we keep up on this. Like, you know, we make sure our banks know. Right. Because within that same press release, the CFPB says almost verbatim, almost no bank actually charges for this. But just in case you thought you could, you can't. And all I can think <laughs> is, oh my gosh, this is kind of a waste of time. Like, <sighs> well, honestly, what's what stuck out to me so much for it is just how almost harsh and upfront the director has been about. It. I mean, so this is a quote from from that that publication. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it said, over the years, large banks and their consultants have concocted new junk fees for fake services that cost almost nothing to deliver. And then she continued by saying banks should be competing to provide better products at lower cost, not innovating to impose extra fees for no value. The CFPB will continue to rid the market of junk fees today and prevent new junk fees from emerging in the future. Gosh, it is. It has been one after another though. Like over the past, what, like 18 months, publication after publication. Cause I think even one of these came in the form of a blog post from the CFPB finding different ways mm -hmm. they could attack different forms of overdraft NSF or return item fees. Um, I agree. I think that you can't outright say you can't do it. Right. So instead they're trying to eliminate the instances where you can. Yeah. And even, even taking the ones, as you explained, even taking the ones that people aren't necessarily doing and just kind of axing them at the, at the source and say, Hey, these are, these are gone and then kind of move on to the next one. And, and who knows, we'll, we'll probably see a few more of these, come out in the in the next little while. I'm sure. Yeah. It just takes some creative thinkers to think of some different other very specific examples that maybe should be unfair. And I, I mean, I got to agree. If you swipe and it's declined, I shouldn't get a, a fee for that. Right. Nothing. The bank didn't have to do anything. Well, it's such a cheap thing for the bank. Like it's not, it's not costing the bank. It's not costing them $35 to decline yeah. that transaction. Right. Yeah. But I, I will say though, from a bank perspective, like that's a, like, non sufficient funds fees and overdraft fees and things like that that's a huge source of revenue that that's that's getting attacked i like i've seen banks respond to this in, in a variety of different ways and it's very interesting to kind of see what happens in the market because of it i do think though like just in our experience with community banks while it can be a big revenue source it's also definitely a need and desire from the community that that, that service exists Right. Yeah. Banks aren't pushing it on anybody or like the good banks. Right. We maybe right. we can think of an example or two where, where that yeah. could happen. Um, but sure, we come up with some name. maybe um, but the, the best of the best. Right. We're not pushing it. Customers want it. They want that that service. And that service does cost the bank some money to do, not to mention the risk involved in basically I hate to use this phrase, but extending them a very short term loan. Right. Floating yeah. that money until they come back with it. So I hate to use that. And light of the new reg Z um, implications. But I think it all goes to show that I, I think that mm, I think the true problem here is probably I'm going to get on my little personal soapbox world, according to Ashton. Probably we need to make sure that the education system is a little bit um, enhanced so that it preaches good money management and good financial management and that that's a standard class in high school, right? Or something like that, where we're making sure that that our citizens and our consumers are better informed and can make better choices. I mean, if you want to talk about something that costs something, Girl Scout cookies have definitely broken my wallet a time or two. But guess what? I will pay for it because they are delicious. They are delicious. <laughs> and you are supporting activities for young girls. So keep doing it. Keep doing it. So, so. <laughs> Let's look forward for the next couple of weeks, Dan, because we'll be back here again the first Monday in March. What kind of episodes can our listeners look forward to hearing over the next few weeks? You know, one of the ones that that, that I had a lot of fun with was actually I had the chance to speak with a, a BSA officer um, and she was actually from Ukraine. And so we had the chance of, of really kind of discussing some of the, the international conflict that's going on with Ukraine and Russia and, and Israel and everything like that and, and how that impacts the, the financial sector and, and what steps banks should be taking when it comes to things like OFAC and, and, and 
CIP and and customer due diligence and enhanced due diligence and everything like that. So that's probably one of the episodes I'm I'm most looking forward to. Uh, do you have Did you have any that that you're looking forward to this month, Ashton? One that I have that we'll post this month. I mentioned um, last month because it was on the schedule and I was excited, but I'm still excited for it to publish. Is someone sharing um, the financial uh, literacy connection to mental health? So the the effect that that your finances play on your mental health and that episode was great because our guest, Kirsten Robinson, her passion shows through and that connection is mm-hmm. one we think about frequently. So I loved that episode and I'm excited for our listeners to hear it. Oh, good. Should be a good month. It should be. And as always, if any of you at home or work are interested in joining us for an episode, please reach out. Dan and I would love to visit with you. And if there's anything you want us to talk about on these monthly episodes, let us know that too. Any closing words, Dan? No, I just like to second that. Ash and I are always looking for new people to to interview for our podcast. And we're always looking for new new talks and ideas. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. That's Thinking Matters.